Well, hey everybody, it's Dr. Angela, the author incubator, and I am joined today by best-selling author Kathy O'Bear to talk about her journey from having an idea to write a book to getting not just one, but how many books do you have now? Three. three? Yes, not just one, but three books in about two years. Yeah, about almost 18 months. 18 months, three books. It's been a long journey. <laughs> yeah, right? Long and short. So uh, so we're going to talk about Kathy's journey today. I'm excited to share with you how she went from having the dream of writing a book for decades to getting three done in just 18 months. Not just any, uh, not just any books either. One of her books sold over 17,000 copies in the first week that it was released. Um, tens of thousands of people have been reached by her message and she has only been an author for less than two years. So imagine the impact you could make with less than two years focused in the right way. So Kathy, thanks for joining me for this conversation. I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. Well, let's just get started. I know you'd wanted to write a book for a long time, but tell us a little bit about before you and I met and started working on your books. Um, where were you? Where were you in your business? Tell me about your ideas uh, for writing a book and how come you didn't have one already? Well, I'd been training and teaching about navigating difficult situations for 20 years. And I'd written my dissertation on the topic and had this dream of writing a book. When I went back, I looked, I found three different manuscripts. One was 80, one was 50, and another was about 40. I know. And I didn't even know where they all were until I pulled them all together. And I had just tried to write this book, but I was realizing I was trying to write it for somebody that wasn't my ideal reader. Mm. I was writing it in APA style for more an academic, because I work a lot in colleges and universities, and I thought that was how I had to write my book. And it just wasn't who I was. It also wasn't how I wanted my message to get out to the world. And so I had a very successful training, consulting, speaking business, but I wasn't reaching the thousands of people I wanted to reach, and I wanted to write this book. So I have a question for you, because I did a PhD. And when I finished my dissertation, the first thing I thought was, I'm going to switch this from the academented language and turn it into like a book for regular people. My book was about um, social justice and how live performance could be used for social justice mm. in a way recorded things couldn't. And so I'm like, I know this has practical use. I did a project with a, a birth program about... Um, uh, kind of natural birth that was part of the dissertation. Wow. So I was like, I know this has practical use. I am going to immediately turn this into a book and, you know, get it into people's hands. That still hasn't happened. That was back in 2005. <laughs> so when you finished your dissertation, were you thinking like, hey, I want to do a oh, yeah. consumer version of this? Like, I know this would help people in the workplace. Actually, no, I didn't really have those thoughts okay. to you. What were you thinking? I was really just thinking university, people doing social mm -hmm. justice work, and how they, when they're triggered doing facilitating workshops on racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, ah. how they get triggered. Faculty in the classroom who are teaching around social justice, so psychology, sociology, social work. That who I thought my end product was for. And I was just pretty limited. And those folks think in the academented. Was that academented. Your I loved it. <laughs> and I just kept stumbling over it because I never felt good enough to write an academic book. Right. All those old messages were just so up in me. Well, and it's not just old messages. They get reinforced. Academia yeah. reinforces that message on purpose. It helps. It's got job security elements to it. So, so successful training program. You're making a difference every, you know, every day when you go to work. You know you can see the impact you're having on universities and communities and associations. But the dream of writing a book keeps coming back, mm -hmm. coming back, coming back. Sounds like you tried to do it on your own. Did you make any other investments? Did you ever go to writer's workshops? Did you work with a book coach, an editor? Did you ever try and get it done with help before you found me? Not in those ways. I did write for academic journals mm -hmm. and do a chapter or two in a couple different books. But again, those didn't feed my soul in the same way. People mm -hmm. were using them in graduate programs, master's, doctorate levels, so I'd get excited at conferences where people come up and, oh, you're Kathy O'Bear, I read, you, read your article. And so that was exciting, but again, it was a very limited audience because it was a very, actually very privileged audience in master's and doctoral programs. Hmm. Interesting. So 
what was it that made you take the leap and say, I'm going to work with Angela, I'm going to get I'm going to get this done. Hopefully, you felt like you were committed to actually getting it done. What changed, do you think? When, now that you asked that, I also was doing some work with folks in more community organizations, and I realized the writing I had was more academic mm -hmm. and inaccessible. So I wanted to write. And then it was one of those kismet kind of things where through Martha Beck and Brooke Castillo, I then ran into you and saw one of your ads, and I just had a visceral reaction that I knew I had to work with you. Yeah, and all I saw was at the time it was 13 weeks and you'll have a book and that was the hook that got me because I'd been doing it for years and I thought if I can have a book in 13 weeks I don't care what it takes could be a bad 13 weeks <laughs> but I'm doing it but I was doing it and I signed up you took well I applied you took me and I was just so grateful and then we started yeah so um, so you came in to write turn the tide mm -hmm. at the time you wrote that were you thinking it was going to be your only book or yes. did you yeah. I, I, I couldn't see beyond it at all. I couldn't even see that I could complete it. I just had faith, put the money down, and you were so clear, and I'm like, okay, I'll do what it takes. Yeah, and you definitely showed up to do that. Well, let's talk about the writing process for that book. What, what, was, what surprised you about it? What was easier or harder than you thought it would be? I had never thought about having an ideal writer. Or, sorry, reader. ideal reader. You're, you're the ideal writer. I was, that's who I was. <laughs> and so I was trying to write to a broad audience. You can probably hear tell higher ed, community, fact, I was all over the place. And that was the first real difficult, and it felt like you were scrunching me in. This metaphor of a cookie, you know, the cookie machine, you put the dough in and then you just keep squeezing. The, yeah. yeah. That's what the entire 13 week felt. That was you. And your entire difference process. And so that was the first part. So I have to really get clear who I was speaking to and write that out. That was incredibly helpful at the time. I resisted. I didn't want to do it. But by the time I wrote it out, I, it's just like I flowed. I'm like, that's who I'm speaking to. Mm. And what I found is so many other people can relate to it, but it helped me write because it kept me on track. Yeah. So this is the part, it's funny, I will call, very often refer to my authors as being brave. And I know that people don't know what I mean by that, but this, I think, is one of the bravest things we can mm. do as a writer. It's trusting that other people will find you when you're speaking just to one person. I think one of the things that's so hard about the ideal reader exercise is it makes you feel like, oh, but there's all these people I could help yeah. that now I'm not helping. So what's happened with writing the book for one person? Have you found all those other people you were worried about leaving behind have found you anyway? I believe so. I'll hear people when I'm on a campus or an organization doing a workshop, they'll come up or they'll email me and say they've read the book and they're the sister of somebody. Or mm -hmm. the second book I wrote, but I'm not racist, I did a book club and on the virtual book club, the mother of someone who works at university was there and she was working in some corporate environment and she loved the book. And so that just reminded me when I just write to one person, it opened us up to others. Yeah. But even when I started the second book, I didn't believe you. Even though it was so successful the first time, I still resisted writing just to one person. Yeah. But it works. It is, it is like a huge leap of faith. But I just find people can, people are actually pretty smart. And they can figure out like, oh, I know she wrote this for this person, but here's how I fit into the mm -hmm. puzzle. Like, it's easier to read than if you're like trying to talk to everybody. It just doesn't feel personal or intimate or like you mm -hmm. can connect with the author in the same way so so you get through the process of writing turn the tide um what are some of the things um and i know you've written two books since then but what are some of the things that came out of the first time becoming an author getting bestseller status on amazon especially coming from an academic world, which mm -hmm. can be, um, you know, I'll say judgmental. We, they, we, we like our peer-reviewed articles in the <laughs> academic world. <clears throat> what was the reaction? Do you feel like it gave you more confidence, less confidence? Did it change how people reacted to you? All of the above. Yeah. I felt different. I energetic, was standing up taller, I actually felt like I was an author because I was. And so there was a confidence, there was a way I moved in the world. Not arrogance, it was actually humble, more humility, that I could be useful and of service and had a lot to learn. <laughs> what I found was 
people would use the book, they'd come to more workshops, more people would ask me to come into the organizations, do workshops on navigating difficult situations, navigating triggers. Were you already doing workshops on navigating difficult situations? Always already doing it. I found that people saw me differently with the book. Isn't that interesting? It was so interesting. Now some of it is a little disconcerting. It's like, yeah, it's still me. It's yeah. still me. And yet I think I energetically showed up differently with more confidence and more clarity. Writing that book, again, I've been trying 20 years teaching about it, but writing the book had me get so crystal clear to have to put it on paper concisely that then I think when I was training and speaking or coaching oh, that I was much more clear. Much I totally had that exact same yeah. experience. I'm like, I've been doing this stuff forever, but once I wrote The Difference, I was like so much more. I owned it so much more. Yeah. That it was, it's fascinating how that works. So what do you think the difference was between those 20 years that you were, those three manuscripts, the 80 pages, 50 pages, 40 pages on your own? What do you think was the difference between that and, and why did you get it done working with us? I really think it was the cookie cutter. The structure of weekly conversations with editor, you're reading it, giving feedback, the editor giving feedback helped me stay on track, and we were with a cohort that met weekly, and so I wanted to show up, but I was supported by folks. And to be honest, once I made the decision I was gonna do it, you kept saying, once you decide, it's already done. Mm -hmm. And while I still didn't quite believe you, <laughs> I believed you enough in faith that I just kept writing. So this is what I find <laughs> about the group thing. What I find is, you don't believe me about you, mm. but you believe me about everybody else. I watched them change. I watched them write. Right. So you're like, well, all those other people paid, and they're all going to get the book. So I guess I could be the one person who doesn't, but it's like you could see them so much clearer than you because you see how brilliant they are. Like, you see how smart they are. Yeah. And, like, you don't question that for them in the way you question it for yourself. I think it's so, I think groups are so powerful that way. As you're talking, the other thing that helped is on those weekly calls, there were people who were in their second, third, and fourth book. Mm -hmm. And so I got to see who they were and the questions they were asking you, which I didn't understand yet, but I knew we're at week five, six, or seven, but I saw it was possible. And mm -hmm. so I started to believe more. And as you said, just write it on your calendar. So I did. Mm -hmm. A couple hours here, several hours there, stuck to it, wrote. Wasn't always great writing time, but I did it. And I just kept going. Writing forward is, I think, what you would Keep say. writing forward, exactly. So the first book comes out. Now, I have to say, I never told you this, but I have to say I don't think there's a harder world to introduce a book to than the academic world because mm -hmm. everybody in academia writes books. So, And then they all have many opinions that they are trained to espouse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... That had to feel pretty vulnerable, actually, because yeah. when you're doing a workshop, maybe there's, you know, 10, 100, even if there's a 1,000 people in the room, those are the only people in the room. The door is shut. Those are the people who are there. So now you're putting it down for everyone to else the to world. see. Yeah. So how did, you, how did you coach yourself through that? How did you, did you have any moments where you oh, thought, yeah. maybe I won't publish this? Um not that I won't, but I was scared to, mm. to get more visible, to get more out there. And so it's not only academics in the faculty realm, people in social justice who can also, we call it social justice arrogance, and I can fall into it pretty quickly myself, thinking I'm better than others or I have the right answer, as opposed to there are many ways to create liberty and justice. So I was scared to get more vulnerable, to get more visible. And what I found was, is I was vulnerable in the book, because I tell stories, I talk about being ineffective, I find people tell me they could relate in, appreciated that I got so honest, and then that built a relationship so then they could get honest and do the healing work, the inner work themselves. And I find when I'm doing workshops, I show up even more vulnerable and honest the same. Again, not telling out of my head, not conceptually mm. teaching, though I do that, but I'll just say, here's what I did, can you relate? And then people get out of their kind of having to be perfect energy and yeah. show up more honest, and that's when we can do the work. Yeah, that's so powerful. Well, I don't think there's any more vulnerable book that we have ever published than your second book, oh. but I'm not racist. That is the conversation that everyone's afraid to have, even alone in a room with their best friend, never mind in a book. How did you, 
I know the answer to this question. How did you make the decision for that to be your second book? Well, it was actually going to be my third, and uh -huh. we talked, and you said, oh, no. Given That's what's we going sat on, it in was a you. villa at a porch in a in villa Tuscany. in Tuscany, and I pretty much twisted your arm. I was like, I will be your ideal reader. I need this book. Yeah. Please write it for me. Write it for me today. <laughs> and that was literally a year ago. Yeah. And so I wrote it. And that was back when Barack Obama was our president. Yes. Remember? It is hard to remember, but yes. And then come November, at least I didn't expect. So I wrote that book. I wrote it because I really wanted so many more whites to be able to work with other whites in ways that I have been found, have found to be so effective. Mm. One of my other deep passions in the world was dismantle racism to create racial justice. And I find that whites sit back and watch people of color, people of multiracial, biracial take the lead, and they're exhausted. They're having racial battle fatigue and still going on. And whites well, are Well, I bad. felt, I mean, this was one of the huge revelations for me with that book. It's like, I felt like I was taking the lead because I would ask my black friends all the time what to do. <clears throat> I know. I, I felt too. really good about it. I was like super proud of myself. I would be like, and how should I remember a thing happened at Jesse's school? Uh, my son, he's 11, but this happened when he was like five or six. And there was no, February came and went, and there was no acknowledgement at his school of wow. African American History Month, which I thought was bizarre. And then at Jesse's school, they're the only African Americans in the school, African Americans, Caribbean Americans, the only people of color at all in the school were the cafeteria workers yeah. and the janitors. And so I found the two or three black moms in the school, and I called them. And I was like, hey, what are we going to do? Like, I, I was like, please give me the instruction. You're black. You tell should know. Yeah, tell me what to do. And I can't believe how, like, proud of myself I was yeah. for years of, like, giving all this extra work <laughs> to my black friends. Well-intended white people. Ugh, that I was absolutely blew my mind that I had a responsibility. That the, or that they didn't. Like, I was expecting, like, send flowers. I've noticed there's a racial injustice here. <laughs> I've done my Please job. Please take action. <laughs> and I so relate. And I have so many more stories like that where I thought I was doing good work, but actually burdening yeah. and not showing up as true partners. Yeah. And so the vulnerability of that book, particularly, yeah. I talk a lot about healing. I talk about doing our own work as whites in the arrogance. Well, and you talk about getting called out by people. Oh, yeah. And this was a big turning point for me being grateful. Mm -hmm. So that actually happened to me after I read your book. I had an African American acquaintance, not even friend, like call me out for doing something and I instantly slip, slip, slipped into gratitude. I remembered that part mm -hmm. of your book. Like I didn't even, I didn't even have to make the pit stop at defensive. I just went straight into gratitude. And then I went into gratitude for having read your book because <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Oh, I'm like, because it would have been even easier for her to not say something. Yeah. She took a risk. Right. Right. So that book happens to come out the day after inauguration or the day before inauguration, um, which obviously sitting in Tuscany, we never could have known how much this book would be needed. And within days, 17,000 copies downloaded. To date, over 25,000 copies downloaded. Um, what kind of response, have, what's your inbox looked like? What have people said to you? Have you gotten uh, criticism of that book? It's a conversation I have not heard before. I expected far more pushback and blowback. I had one person who said they'd be on my launch team and then wrote me and said they couldn't because they didn't agree with the type of healing work I was really recommending for whites or the way I was thinking we need to work in affinity groups. And okay. that's the only in writing, social media to my face negative comment I've gotten. Wow. And that was my greatest fear because you know so many folks, especially since the election, whites that are out doing the work, folks of color doing the social justice work, have gotten incredible resistance. Mm -hmm. What I have found is so many whites have just been able to take a deep breath and exhale. Mm. And they're like, I've always felt scared, nervous, defensive, guilty, ashamed. And now I see a way out. I see a way through. And I have people just, just this week, someone sent me a picture. They just are doing a book club in their organization. 
and they sent a picture and they put it on Facebook and they're continuing dialogues and developing whites to then be able to go out and work with other whites to support the work to create inclusive organizations, partnering instead of sitting back or going in and taking over, which is the other thing yeah. we do as whites. Yeah, 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 totally. So powerful. So how has that book affected your business? I know you were doing training on hot buttons in the workplace. How has that, uh, has that changed your curriculum? Has it changed what you're training, who you train for? What I've now moved into is I've started doing a year-long mentoring program. Mm. So in addition to my individual coaching, executive coaching, I decided I wanted to support change agents that really wanted to up their game and accelerate their impact on the world. And so having that second book, I have more whites and some folks of color who realize they want to just really transform in their organizations, local, even in the whole society. And so working with a small group of folks it just fills my soul. Yeah, how is that different, mentoring somebody for a year as opposed to going in and doing a, a workshop, a four-hour workshop, an eight-hour workshop? I've been doing trainings for 30 years, and I still get excited by them, but I never know what's going to change. And places that have me come back, I see sometimes not much has shifted. Individuals grow, but the organizations may not shift. And I just hit a milestone in my life, and so I don't, I don't see that many ahead of me. Mm. And so I really want to have my legacy built. And so having a year long, I see week by week people growing and changing differently and they're using the tools, the strategies out in their world and they're gaining a little more confidence. We're also able to do some more of the inner healing work, the fear, the anxiety, the old issues that they're tripping over. And so able to do all that as I'm working with them individually and we work together as a group and in retreats. Hmm. So that's been one huge change. The other is, is my training, coaching, consulting business has grown exponentially. That having these two books and people know a third one's coming out, I'm getting more calls, I'm turning down far more work, mm -hmm. and so I'm able to choose to work with individuals, groups, and organizations that really want to make a difference. I used to take most anybody that came in my door, and now I have much clearer criteria that if they are about liberation, social justice, really organizational, meaningful, sustainable change, then I'm willing to invest at them. Because I don't want to just do a training and have everyone say, that was great, put it They check the box. I want to make a difference through other people. Yeah, that's so powerful. So especially with how hard social justice activists have been working in the past year or so, um, your third book seems to be also as well-timed as your second. Let's talk about what's coming out for you and why it was so important for you to write this third book especially this last year, and actually since Ferguson, I found more and more folks just exhausted in deep burnout. Still going on, getting up each day, but getting sicker, or it's impacting their life, it's impacting the quality of their relationships. And for literally 30 years, I've been on a healing journey, emotionally, physically, mm -hmm. spiritually, and I realized I had something I wanted to say that might be useful to other social justice change agents and other folks who are doing organizational change, maybe without an inclusion lens. And so I wrote, In It for the Long Haul, um, Overcoming Passion Fatigue and Burnout for Social Justice Change Agents. And my intent is people realize they're not alone. It's not that they're not incompetent. It's not that they just don't have enough passion and energy. Which is the message at the rallies. I know. Like, I mean, the, the thing I always hear is like, you know, we've been fighting and we're going to keep fighting and we're strong. And But it, it's hard to acknowledge, like, what I see is a lot of people with, like, you know, bad skin and gaining weight and just feeling like crap and drinking. Like, a lot of times after a rally, everyone will go drinking. You're making posters. After you're making posters, you're going drink. Like, there's a lot of... I relate. Um... Uh, just like, how do I get through it? But Brooke would call our, we have a coach, Brooke Castillo, who would call it buffering, but a lot mm -hmm. of buffering techniques just to get through to the next fight. Right. Get enough there was energy. a report that came out in D.C. that said 80% of people in D.C. have been to a protest in the last year. It's wow. like everyone, and we're all tired. Yes. Like, we're exhausted. Yeah. And then such shame if I don't want to go to that next protest. I don't oh, want I know. to go to the next forum. I can't write that next strategic plan or create change. And we take it the individual level without looking systemically what's going on. So I'm hoping this book will help people realize actually we need to have community care. 
Mm. We need to be looking out for each other as well as ourselves. It's not selfish. It's not self-indulgent. I'm not just doing it out of my privilege. But no human being can keep this up. And in fact, if we individually do it, actually the system will win because we're all going to drop out. But if we do community care, change how we do activism inside organizations and outside, trying to change society, together we can make a difference. So powerful. So what do you think are... Um, what do you think are the biggest changes in your life over the last 18 months since we started working together in your life, in your business? What would you say are the, the top benefits for you of doing this work? I'm seeing, even just yesterday, more and more ways that I can make a difference in the world. And I didn't even know it was 25,000 with that second book. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of how many more people have tools and strategies and worksheets from my website so on their own they can take it and use it or if they want to work with me individually or in groups or... And so I just have this confidence that I know I'm here for a reason and I see more and more that's just going to unfold. And so I just have this confidence that whatever I do will make a difference and it'll be revealed to me how I'm supposed to be influencing thousands and thousands more. And you have a new program you're putting together, don't you? I am. It's similar to the... It's out of my Center for Transformation and Change and it'll be another year or two long program but now I want to work specifically with people who want to facilitate change at the individual group and organizational level and really want to get their skills to facilitate workshops and trainings to help everyone else get the skills in their organization and their communities. And so I want them to learn how to teach about social justice, well, what I wrote about, how to dismantle racism, and then how to create wellness and passion excitement instead of passion fatigue as we're shifting systems. And so it's everything that I know, I want to put it into a structure so that not only this year-long development program I have now, who are more change agents, but now I want to even fine-tune it more so the facilitators and the trainers in the world can do what I do, and we just multiply it thousands of times. So if you were to look at your life's work up to the time mm -hmm. that you wrote a book, a lot of you were doing a lot of work on building your skill set, building your expertise, building your experience. Would you say that from the time where you've written your book to now, since you started your first book, that you're focused more on legacy and how to Clearly. Uh, maybe impart some of that expertise so that it lives beyond you? Clearly. And to create the structures and systems so it really lives on while I'm still alive, which I hope will be a long time. Yeah, we do too. <laughs> so people can from books to worksheets to videos to working with me, all of that I'm trying to develop the next generations. Whereas mm -hmm. before I was training in the moment and I wasn't thinking about that I'm an elder now and that my responsibility is to change the next generation so they can be trainers of trainers, trainers of facilitators, trainers of change agents. So that's my vision. That's so powerful, so powerful. Well, you are gonna hear more about Kathy and her vision if you Stay tuned, just after this, we are gonna take a quick commercial break, and then you are gonna get to see Kathy's Thai Talk. Kathy, what's your Thai Talk called? It is called Taking the High Road, Responding Effectively When Our Buttons Get Pushed. Awesome, well, you will learn more about how to take the high road from Kathy Aubert in her short Thai Talk. will be coming up right after this break. Please stay with us. And if you are thinking about how you can create a legacy, how can you take what you have learned and pass it on to the next generation in a way that lasts beyond your lifetime, but also in a way that you can see and enjoy and be a part of how that information, knowledge, and wisdom gets passed on, then you may want to think about writing a book with us. And to do that, just go to www.theauthorincubator.com slash apply. Kathy, I'll ask you to have a final word here. If somebody is thinking about writing a book with us and they're not sure uh, if it's a good idea, mm -hmm. if it's a good fit for them, what advice would you give them? What would you tell them? I'd say to get on a call with you, to have a conversation, maybe talk to a few other authors, but mostly to go inside and see if it is the time to get their message out to the world and to choose courage over fear. Choose courage over fear. Well, you choose courage over fear and stay with us to see Kathy's speech. And um, if it is the right time for you to write a book, I look forward to reading your application. You can drop it in at theauthorincubator.com slash apply. 
Kathy, thanks so much for joining us today and for your amazing work and your books. I can't wait to hear your tie talk. Thank you so much.